Since the creation of the Blizzard title Diablo, there have been quite a few titles taking pages from its formula. Fate, Torchlight, Hellgate London, arguably, and all have met with varying degrees of success, but people still held Diablo and its much-celebrated successor Diablo 2 in higher regard. About the time Diablo 3 was on the horizon, an indie upstart New Zealand developer got started on their own foray into the Diablo-style games. Much of the praise it was getting during its closed beta run was vastly overshadowed by the return of the king, so to speak. Of course, that didn't, uh, go as well as planned. So now with the upstart finally making its way to open beta, and Diablo 3 being the controversial thing that it was, let's see if this is something that people were looking for out of Diablo's successor. This is the MMO Grinder, and it's time to look at Path of Exile. While I gave this game a lot more attention to my side quest on it, I'll go into more detail seeing as how everyone seemed to have missed that video anyway. Developed and published by New Zealand-based game company Grinding Gear Games, Path of Exile is a Diablo-styled RPG with an emphasis on dungeon grinding and inventory management, but giving a major focus to the multiplayer aspect. The story of Path of Exile involves you playing as one of several character class types, who are tossed aboard a ship and exiled from their kingdoms to a dangerous continent filled with other exiles, and dangerous wildlife. So essentially, it's a fantasy version of the founding of Australia. Hopefully people won't have burnt themselves out on this title by now, but let's get this started for those of you who might not have heard of this yet. There's a major kind of aesthetic that follows Path of Exile. Dark, grim, bleak, desolate, exactly the kind of thing you'd expect from being left on the shores of a hostile island, with nothing but the tattered rags upon your back and being forced to pick up the discarded remains of armor and weapons once belonging to fallen warriors, and now ravaged by the harsh environments. What you wear is displayed upon your character as well, it really lends to the aesthetic of being in exile. The game's environments and characters are rendered in 3D, but the game is mostly 2.5D, giving you an above-the-playfield view of the action. Enemies, especially the early ones, give off this unpleasant look of wetness, to mirror the fact that they're mostly waterlogged corpses and sea-dwelling monstrosities. There's also occasions of gore and viscera scattered around in areas, and the game, while not overtly violent, definitely lends itself to a more mature audience. The shiny, wet look of the enemies and environments is handled beautifully by this game's lighting effects, giving rise to shiny surfaces and dancing shadows, some that follow along with your character, like in cave environments. It's probably one of the coolest sights in this game. A downside is that a lot of environments do tend to look repetitive, in that you see one cave, you've seen them all kind of way. But the areas do get more expansive and open up to more variety as you progress throughout the game, especially when you come across the vast jungles and harsh deserts of Act 2. A feature that was finally implemented and was previously hinted at in my side quest is that a lot of the graphical details were unable to be appreciated since you couldn't zoom in to see them. Well, now you can. It's a nice touch, but I wouldn't recommend playing the game while zoomed in, seeing as how much you lose the view of the playfield when you do so. This is decent, really good music, built mostly for ambiance. Henceforth, it suffers of being one of those soundtracks that requires you to listen to it outside of the game to really appreciate its complexity. In-game, the soundtrack is usually overpowered by the sounds of battle. The sounds of battle do fit the visceral theme of the game. Arrows make a very impactful thud when fired and landing. Magic is explosive and powerful sounding, and the strikes sound painful and impactful. The game features some surprisingly good voice acting seen in short bursts, be it from your character introductions when selecting your class, the NPCs you find in-game, or even when your character is aligned for leveling up or having a full inventory. Since suitable kindling is in short supply around these parts, I have little option but to make do with what I have. Namely, you. It's solid all around, but even though the nature of the dungeon grinder might make you want to provide your own background noise, you really won't feel forced to. The game is pretty easy to start out. You can choose from three location servers when you start out, and choosing to have the game save your password for easy relogging. As per the open beta, the game had met with some population spikes, resulting in server queues during peak times. The message also informed you that these server upgrades are on the way, so I can't imagine this being an issue that will remain in the long run, but be wary about it now. When starting out, you'll be taken to an empty character screen, so click Create to start one up. Here you can choose from six classes. From left to right, we start with the Templar, a melee magic-wielding priest character who starts off with a staff. 
Next is the Shadow, a quick attacking melee assassin type character who can specialize in dual wield fighting or even supplement his attacks with magic. After him comes the Marauder, a massive hulking man who starts with a two-handed hammer. He's the defensive melee bruiser. Next is the Ranger, a bow-wielding woman who can supplement her arrow attacks with magic or focus her skills in melee. After her comes the Duelist, a balanced fighter type specializing initially in one-handed swords. Finally, there's the pure magic user, the Witch. She can cast a myriad of powerful magical spells and even raise the dead to fight alongside her. Once you've chosen your character and named them, you can choose between making them on one of two leagues, more of which will be implemented later. Right now, there's Default and Hardcore, the latter of which offering greater rewards when played. Unlike other RPG games of this type, Hardcore mode does not mean permadeath. However, the second you die in the Hardcore League, your character is automatically sent to the Default League with all their current inventory intact. So there's no real penalty for at least trying it. There are other leagues planned for the game in the future, like a PvP-focused one, one where you cannot trade with NPCs for those looking for a more unforgiving experience. Controls are quite simple to grasp. Left-click anywhere on the environment to move, and left-click on an enemy to target and attack it. Once you start unlocking skills, you can assign them to right-click, middle-click, and the hotkeys Q, W, E, R, and T. If you're an active MOBA player, this should feel rather familiar to you. You can also hold left-click while on an enemy to continuously attack them. Your active skills are available in gems, which you'll receive your first one almost immediately. In order to use it, there are slots in your character's starter weapon, along with other gear you'll find as you play. Match the gem color to the slot of the same color, and as long as you're wearing that piece of gear with a slotted gem, you can use that skill. Unslotting and reslotting gems is as simple as just right-clicking them and putting them in a new spot, so don't be afraid to slot them to any piece you'd like. Skill gems also raise an experience as long as you have them slotted, so you don't actually have to use the skill in order to raise their level. You may also notice you have a couple potions slotted to 1 through 5. Starting out, you'll get 2 health potions and 1 mana potion. You'll gain more later and change them around at your leisure. Here's the thing about potions. You'll notice the first time you use one that it doesn't completely deplete itself. Instead, the potions use charges, and those charges replenish themselves as you kill enemies. Entering a town also automatically refills potions, unless you're playing on that upcoming proposed Iron Man League I mentioned earlier. As the game progresses, you'll find larger potion bottles that will replenish more health with each charge, and even find some specialty vials that might offer other bonuses when used, like giving you a temporary speed boost or replenishing your health instantly instead of gradually at the cost of not gaining as much per charge. It's a really interesting system, and while it might make the game sound too easy, you'll find yourself in situations where spamming your health potions won't bring you up fast enough, or even noticing your health potions aren't recharging during boss fights, as there may be no other enemies to kill. There are two distinct area types in this game, towns and dungeons. I say dungeons as a catch-all because there could be anything from prisons to caves to open deserts or forests, but I'm referring to any area where you'll encounter enemies. Dungeons are also randomly generated, so the environment map won't always stay the same if you've not been in one for a while. In towns, you'll find the NPCs where you can sell off gear you've acquired and find quests to perform. Act 1 only has one town area, accessible by walking to it and using a portal scroll, or finding numerous waypoints in the dungeons. When in a dungeon you come across a waypoint, be sure to use it, even if you have no reason to head back to town. This will save the waypoint as a selectable area, and make getting around much, much easier. Not every dungeon is a waypoint, so keep it in mind. They're usually marked out on the quest map, accessible by pressing U. You can also click the icon pertaining to your quest to see what dungeon area you need to head into in order to complete it. The other map system can be toggled in the options menu or by pressing tab. By default, the map will be displayed in the upper left corner, a rather stylized map of simple lines and colors, but easy enough to understand. Orange marks on the map are bridges and tunnels, blue marks are waypoints, and red marks are entrances to a new dungeon section or a town. Pressing tab will bring the map to cover up the center of the screen, which is most useful for getting the larger view of the area, and if you start getting lost, you can see where you still haven't visited in the dungeon. While the map is in the center, the upper right corner will tell you the name of the dungeon as well as the level of the monsters inside. You can press tab again to cycle the map back to the corner. When killing enemies, they have a good chance to drop loot, but it's also pretty easy to miss by default. If you have as much trouble seeing loot drops as I tended to, you can make it much easier on yourself by holding Alt to highlight and label the items that have dropped. You can also switch this on permanently by pressing Z to toggle it on or off, or finding the option in the menu. Your inventory space is extremely limited, as per the norm of this type of RPG. It's entirely based upon a grid system, where certain items and equipment are represented by a number of squares, as few as one or as many as eight. The game's pretty good about automatically organizing when you pick up items if you have the space for it, but sooner or later you're going to have to drop stuff to make room for other items that are a priority. It's much better to pick up an uncommon or rare level item that only takes up four squares than to keep a normal level item that takes up six. You can sell off your excess items to NPCs, and the value of the item is not affected by the number of squares it takes up, only the quality. 
Value is an odd word to be using in this game, really, as the game has no traditional currency system. Instead, when selling items, you will receive scraps of items such as orbs, or most basically, the Scrolls of Wisdom. While the Scroll of Wisdom is meant to be used as an identifier, allowing you to equip the high-quality unidentified gear by right-clicking on them and then right-clicking on the gear piece, you'll end up with so many of them that the game uses them and other small modification items as barter. For example, when you enter a shop and see there's a piece of gear you want, the price of that gear might be three Scrolls of Wisdom or one Orb of Altercation. The key is deciding whether or not you want to keep the orbs and scrolls to better your gear or trade them off for shop items that you know you'd want anyway. This lack of the traditional gold, silver, copper might put people off to the game at first, but there is one very distinct advantage to this. NO GOLD SPAMMERS! You'll notice that you gain a lot of these specialty orbs. They can alter the secondary properties of a magic item, turn a normal item into a magic or even a rare item, boost the quality of an item to give it a slight stat boost, among many, many more. Make sure to read the description of the orb to understand if it's something you might want to use or save. You have a large stash available in towns to store gear, orbs, and other items in order to save them for later. To use orbs or scrolls in their traditional sense, just right-click the orb or scroll that you wish to use and click on the piece of unequipped gear you wish to modify. Just make sure you read the rules to see exactly what it's going to do first. You'll notice a bit of color scheme going on pertaining to things like your stats and skill gems, red, green, and blue. As a rule of thumb, red pertains to melee and strength attacks, green pertains to dexterity and ranged abilities, and blue pertains to intelligence and magic skills. It's important to keep this in mind when choosing gear, mostly considering the color of the skill slots. You might find that equipment pieces tend to follow this color scheme with their slots, but it's hardly exclusive to it. It's entirely possible to find a magic wand with a red or green skill slot. If you find two identical pieces of gear with two different skill slot colors, it's best to swap out the one with a more useful skill slot configuration. Skill gems come in two types, active and passive. An active gem is a usable skill that you can assign to a hotkey, but a passive gem acts quite differently. You might notice that there are some skill slots that are linked together by a small bar, while others are completely separate. If a skill slot is linked to another, this is where you can use your passive gem. A passive gem will enhance the abilities of the active skill that it's connected to. It's possible to modify multiple active skills this way by taking advantage of the multiple linked slots. Alternatively, you can modify one active skill with multiple passives using the same method. Keep in mind that passive skill gems also follow the color scheme, so it might be tough to find the gear with the appropriate slots for what you're looking to do. While skill gems and slots are but one way you can customize your character, the second and most noted way to modify your character is the passive skill tree, or what I love to call the skill web. There's a massive linked set of passive skills that you can upgrade along multiple branching paths, like upgrading your base stats, boosting your physical attack, or in some specialty cases, adding additional properties to your attack or defense, like adding a piercing effect to arrows or converting all of your invasion to armor points. It's a really interesting system that allows for the creation of some interesting class hybrids. Oh yeah, and in before the whole oh, Final Fantasy X flashbacks, Sphere Grid wasn't that bad. The game also makes use of several elemental statuses, like Fire, Cold, Lightning, and Chaos, to name a few. Many skills, attacks, and weapons might grant bonuses of, or resistances to, these elements, and enemies also display their resistances clearly on the top of the screen when targeted. Making sure you and your team is effective against any possible enemy type is a sound strategy. The main chunks of the game take place in acts, with Act 1 being completable in a decent amount of playtime and acting at least partially as a tutorial, while Act 2 lasts much, much longer and has many more areas to explore. Acts are usually signaled pretty clearly by the massive tough bosses at the end of the storyline, and Act 1 Siren Mervale is no joke. I remember not having that much of an issue taking her down in closed beta, but that all changed here. You'll probably need to drag someone along, so I guess we'll be getting into that next. As of now, towns are the only place you're going to see any other players. While I've noticed the chat logs are often such an incoherent mess that I normally just remove them for the sake of my own sanity, if you want to talk with others, this is the place to do it. By right-clicking on other players in the area, you can add them as friends, send them whispers, ask them to trade items, or invite them to your party. Another much simpler way to get party members is to set up or join a public party from the notice board in town. Clicking the board will either allow you to create a party and give it a name, usually a description of the area you wish to go or the intention of the party, like leveling or completing a certain quest, or you can join the existing parties already listed. As long as the party has space, you can join them at any time, and players are free to come and go as they please. 
There seems to be a weird issue, at least from what I noticed in my few groups, and it's kind of an issue of non-communication between members. All too often I'd notice public groups scattered to the winds, no one in the group taking charge or asking people where to meet. I was in a group of six trying to kill the Act 1 boss and only managed to find one of the party members as the rest continued to rush into the room and die rather than wait on anyone else, and then ended up having to take out the boss with only one other person. It just felt things would have gone a lot smoother or made more sense if someone would just speak up. Yeah, I tried. It didn't work. Of course, general chat is still crawling with mouthy and obnoxious people, so make of that what you will. Although there are a good share of helpful people, too. It's a bit of a coin toss, really. If you're looking to throw down against other players, and since the PvP League isn't implemented yet, once you reach Act 2, an NPC there will allow you to join PvP queues. I tried this twice, and it did not go so well. There doesn't seem to be any real level balancing, so expect to be trounced if you're going in anything but the highest allowed levels. I'd highly suggest going into this game with a group of friends, not so much that the community is bad, but more along the lines the game really lends itself well to having a tight-knit group of people in a voice call, rather than just having to type coherently to strangers. However, this game isn't too rough to solo if you have the patience for it, so it's really your call. This is probably going to be a pretty quick one. Grinding Your Games has been vocally and vehemently opposed to the idea of pay to win in any form, and this shop does well on that promise. The only restriction lifters aren't even all that restrictive in the first place. You can pay to have more character slots, despite you getting plenty already, and additional stash tabs, some with even the ability to rename them for better organization, seemingly created for the player that's very serious about their character and their loot. The remainder of the items in the shop are cosmetic to various degrees, like small pets to follow your character around, effects that modify the look of your armor or weaponry, and alternate effects for your skills, like replacing the standard fireball spell with a flaming bone dragon, or changing summoned skeletons into living statues. There's also the option to purchase a dance emote for all the classes in the game. One interesting but expensive last option in the shop is the ability to spend... wait for it... one thousand dollars for the ability to design your own item that will be featured in the game. I'm not artistically creative, nor rich enough to figure out if that's a good idea, but if you're looking to immortalize your talents in this game and you've got the cash to drop, it's something that I don't see coming up all that often, so there you go. So, another former side quest down. It's good to know that this one, despite its rather lengthy development time, has shaped up to be just as good as it was in closed beta. Whether this game is as good as or better than Diablo, I really can't say, but for those who really enjoy the heavy loot-based dungeon grinding action with a shockingly deep and flexible character building system, you shouldn't be disappointed by this title. Here's my final rating. If you love the Diablo-style gameplay without the Diablo-style DRM, Path of Exile might just be worth a shot for this factor alone. Having a gigantic passive skill tree with branching paths allows for some clever customization that will allow you to play the class in a myriad of ways that you want to play them. So if having choices is your thing, you might want to look here as well. Diablo fans raging at the bright color palette of Diablo 3 might feel a little bit more home with this game's harsh, gritty environment. Rayclast might not be hell, but it's not a rainbow-lined walk in the green flowery meadow either. If you like your games dark and dismal, this is one to see. With grinding gear being so opposed to pay to win, there's absolutely no reason you'd have to pay. Which isn't a bad thing, but it does limit why you'd want to buy anything in the cash shop. I'd highly suggest buying these items if you're just really into your character, as the extra stash tabs will keep your loot in check, and the cosmetic enhancements are interesting, but not required in any way, shape, or form. It's there to make you look cool, and sometimes that's all you want. Really, the best way to think about this cash shop is a way to support grinding your games directly. They're an indie developer with a fantastic title on their hands, and if the idea of being followed around by a blue frog doesn't entice you, then think of it as donating your money as thanks to an aspiring developer. One thing that always got on my nerves about Dungeon Grinders in the Diablo series is that you'll be seeing a lot of the same and similar environments, and Path of Exile is no exception. This game has dozens of dank caves and ruins to slog through, and changing the color scheme or randomly generating the layout doesn't make it feel like I'm somewhere new. If the loot-based click and attack to move dungeon crawling gameplay isn't for you, I am positive that this will not convince you to start enjoying it. So if you didn't like Diablo, Torchlight, or Fate, I doubt this is enough to change your mind. As this game is still in open beta, and there's a lot of planned features missing, you might just want to hold out for a little bit before diving into this game. Population booms, bugs, balance issues, and other plagues of an open beta are still prevalent in this game, so if that bothers you, you might want to give the game time to ripen before you decide to dedicate yourself to it. 
Next time, I've noticed a lot of my former side quests are becoming available for full review, so let me look down the list and see what's available now.